So welcome everyone. My name is Roxana Radu. I'm a research associate at the University of Oxford's program in Comparative Media Law and Policy. And it's a great pleasure to moderate this webinar today. Our topic is of key importance. It's free versus protected information online. It's a timely discussion to have in Europe at the moment, in particular in the midst of discussions on intermediary liability and copyright reform. Needless to say that the COVID-19 crisis has made this debate even more urgent for both policymakers and researchers. Of course, civil society, the private sector and governments are equally involved in, in this debate. And we would like to have as many perspectives as possible represented here today. So I'm hoping that our participants would like to share some of their, some of their opinions on, on the topic. The image of the internet as an information oasis to which everyone has access has slowly been replaced by what we now call a walled garden. It's a metaphor that captures quite well what is happening because most of the time we do not know where the information is located exactly. Uh, there is total obscurity when it comes to what is behind the wall. And there's, there are also limited ways to inquire into the procedures associated with, with the management of information online. In most cases, we can't even peek through the fence because what we are facing is not really a fence, but a thick brick wall. Sometimes we talk about a paywall, meaning that access is restricted to those who have the means to pay for the information. Uh, but this is just one of the many instances in which information is more difficult to reach for the regular user. There are many other instances uh, that uh, do not relate to having the money to pay for it. And the intricacy of protecting information online are worth exploring further as they belong to different regimes of regulation and we have lessons to learn from other sectors as well. This is what we will try to unpack today in, uh, in the next one hour or so. Before I give the floor to our speakers, um, allow me a few minutes to, to set the um, housekeeping rules. I would like to remind everyone that we will be recording the presentations. So the recording will stop as soon as the presentations are over because we aim to have an open discussion afterwards and to facilitate that we will uh, encourage everyone to ask their questions in confidence. I assume that by now most of you are already used to the Zoom <clears throat> webinar format and the possibility of using the chat function to type your questions. Uh, it's very easy to find. There is a chat button at the bottom of your screen, which opens a window on the right. By default, your questions will be visible to everyone, unless you select a particular person to address that too. You can um, type your questions while the presenters uh, speak, but we will have dedicated time in the second part of our webinar to have an interaction um, with, with the audience. And we, we are hoping that this discussion will be as open as possible. If you would like to ask for quick clarifications, please by any means do so, either by using the chat function, uh, and I will pose that to, to the, um, I will pose your questions to the presenters, all by letting me know privately that you would like uh, some clarifications. For the second part of the webinar, uh, the Q&A, there is the possibility of raising your hand to ask the questions directly using your microphone. Our colleague, uh, Robert will unmute you. So uh, just let me know that you would like to speak by raising your hand. To find that function, you need to go to participants and somewhere in the middle, you will find there's a, an, a window opening on the right and somewhere in the middle, you will find the, the option of raising your hand. Uh, so as soon as I call on you, Robert will, will unmute you and we can, <clears throat> we can hear your voice. Um, and have a direct interaction with, uh, with our presenters, which I very much hope that you'll make use of. I am joined today by a truly European panel, and I'm very happy to introduce them to you. We have uh, Mackenzie Nelson and Paddy Learson, who have teamed up for a study that they will present, uh, which is entitled Operationalizing Research Access, What to Learn from Other Industries. It was published by Algorithm Watch in cooperation with the European Policy Center and the University of Amsterdam's Institute for Information Law. And you will see that uh, our two presenters come from these uh, institutions. 
uh, that have uh, authored, uh, that have published the report. So we have McKinsey, who is a researcher and a project manager at Algorithm Watch, a non-for-profit research and advocacy organization based in Berlin. She heads the Governing Platforms Project, which brings together representatives from academia, civil society, platforms, and uh, the policy world to develop evidence-based recommendations for platform governance at the European level. She used to work in DC prior to joining uh, Algorithm Watch. So you can definitely draw on her wide expertise in your, uh, in your question. Paddy is joining us from the Netherlands, where he's a PhD candidate at the Institute for Information Law of the University of Amsterdam. His research focuses on platform governance and media law, with a particular focus on the regulation of transparency under European law. Learson is also a non-resident fellow at Stanford University, uh, University Center for Internet and Society. After they present the findings of their report, we will give the floor to Julia Priora, who is a postdoctoral researcher at the Institute of Law, Politics and Development at Scuola Superiore Sant'Anna in Italy, and an affiliated fellow at CMDS, working on intellectual property law and EU digital policies with a focus on copyright and access to knowledge. If everyone is ready, I'd like to give the floor to Mackenzie first. Mackenzie, can you hear us well? Yeah, um, can hear you great. Thanks, Roxana, for the intro. Um, as you and both Marius mentioned, I am a CU alumna, and um, I worked a little bit with CMDS during my master's program, so I'm very happy to virtually be back at the center um, to present some of my work at Algorithm Watch. So I'm just going to share my screen and turn off my camera so I'm not distracted by my own face and facial expression. And I unmuted myself instead of stopping my camera. We are able to see your screen. Okay, um, perfect. Then I think we're good to go. Um, yeah, so as Roxana mentioned, my name is Mackenzie Nelson, and I am a project manager at Algorithm Watch. I'm heading our governing platforms project, which aims to develop policy proposals for how the EU should go about tackling issues like hate speech, disinformation, and other challenges to the online public sphere. And uh, just to give you an idea of what I'd like to cover during my presentation, I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about Algorithm Watch's work, um, and then how it connects to some of our ideas about platform re regulation, and how those ideas connect to the EU's upcoming Digital Services Act. And then Patty is going to continue on with an overview of the findings from our brand new study, which we just published last week. Um, on operationalizing research access in platform governance. So without further ado, I thought I'd like to start my talk with this tweet that was posted uh, two weeks ago by Instagram's communications team, responding to claims that their algorithms favor content that contains semi-nudity. And the reason why I'm showing you this tweet is because the research that they're referring to was actually conducted by my colleague Nicholas, who leads our journalistic work here at Algorithm Watch. And this team spent a couple of weeks um, analyzing data collected from volunteers who donated their data through uh, our Instagram monitoring plugin, which if you're interested, it's also on our website. Um, you can download it as well. And Nicholas and his team were interested in testing a hypothesis that they had heard from some influencers who felt that Instagram's algorithm, or Instagram's algorithm was favoring pictures when they posted pictures in bikinis or un undergarments. So after analyzing some 2,400 photos and sifting through patents about Instagram's algorithm and how it works, they confirmed uh, the influencers' hunches and they found that posts that contain pictures of women in undergarments or bikinis were 54% more likely to appear in the news feeds of the volunteers that they looked at. And in response to comment, um, Instagram, in addition to posting the comment that I showed on the previous slide, um, they said that our research shows a flawed understanding of how Instagram's algorithm works. Now, how does all of this connect to today's topic of free versus protected information online? What I want to make clear is that it's not just us. I could point to a lot of examples here, uh, be, but because we often pick 
on Facebook, uh, which owns Instagram, of course. I took this example from an investigation that was conducted in collaboration with the New York Times and uh, Harvard's Berkman Klein Center, uh, where researchers found that YouTube's recommendations were favoring often right-wing conspiracy-filled channels in Brazil. Um, and Google's response to this research was very similar to the response that we received from our research, which we think follows a pretty classic formula. Step one, independent researchers try to understand how algorithmic curation, ranking, or content moderation operate beneath the hood in these walled gardens, um, often having to use their own techniques like scraping in the case of um, our Instagram watch, and I think also in the case of this Berkman Klein study. Um, step two is that they reach conclusions. And then step three is that platforms dispute their findings and respond uh, they either don't respond or they deny the request to access the data that they would need to verify or debunk the findings of the researchers. So to put it differently, um, using internet vernacular, when researchers get in touch with platforms and ask them for data about what they would actually need, they're often left on red, which of course, uh, for those who aren't familiar with the millennial internet dating slang, refers to what happens when you get a message from someone and you can see that they have seen the message, but they don't follow up on the message. So why is it a problem for a democracy if researchers are getting left on red? Uh, we need better access to data and information about how platforms curate or amplify or moderate content online in order to diagnose harms and threats, to detect wrongdoing either by users or by the platforms, to help states develop evidence-based policies, which um, we don't always see is the case um, and I could name some examples perhaps in the discussion. And of course, we also need evidence to hold governments accountable for wrongdoings. Um, and what we see is that self-regulatory transparency initiatives have really failed to deliver the kind of transparency that we need. Um, and that the status quo, which is the concentration and privatization of data, has a really deep impact on independent investigations. And what Patty uh, will also tell you a little bit more about is that Oftentimes, researchers find uh, data sets, transparency data sets from platforms to be incomplete, ineffective, unmethodical, and unreliable. So what we say is that we need robust frameworks for data access that are legally enforceable. Which, of course, uh, brings us to the Digital Services Act, um, which is uh, a really interesting and exciting uh, regulatory initiative that I think uh, many of the people on this call are likely watching, um, and that we'll probably discuss as well. Um, and the DSA will basically rewrite the old rules of the internet that were established under the e-commerce directive. And our, one of its aims is to increase and harmonize the responsibilities of online platforms. And lucky for us, it appears that transparency is on the tips of regulators' tongues. Um, and that's captured in this quote that I took from the IMCO committee in the European Parliament, um, which outlines some of their priorities, but we've also seen these priorities reflected in um, documents that were released by the Commission. Um, but the problem with transparency is that it's uh, a, rather abstract uh, a rather abstract concept. And if it's not designed carefully, it can be pretty meaningless. Um, for example, I think it was last week or maybe two weeks ago, TikTok released information about how its algorithms work. Um, and we joined other researchers in saying, you know, this information isn't necessarily useful. You telling me that um, the algorithm is favoring or personalizing content according to my interests, um, that's not really um, telling me a lot about how it operates in practice. And I really love this quote from Margot Kaminsky, who's a law professor at the University of Colorado. And she argues that for transparency to be effective, it has to be designed and it can't just be sprinkled on like a seasoning. It has to be built into a regulatory system from the onset. And again, Patty's gonna tell you a little bit more about how this can uh, happen. He's uh, the lawyer in the house. Uh, so I won't spoil the fun there, but I did want to emphasize that we see the DSA as a real opportunity to move beyond transparency seasoning and make it meaningful by putting data access for research at the top of the agenda. Um, and in case you're a nerd like me, and you've already had a chance to look at the consultation for the DSA, or that the commission has put out for the DSA, you've seen that they're very interested in hearing from folks who have experience working with platform data, um, and specifically about the constraints 
that limit the activities, um, for example, like the research that we tried to conduct on Instagram's algorithm. And um, what we found is that while stories about platforms leaving researchers on read when they ask for more information are all too familiar for those of us who work in the fields, they typically don't reach beyond academic mailing lists or conference roundtables. Um, and we think that should change uh, because we think it's critical that European policymakers are aware that these transparency deficits uh, or aware of these transparency deficits and how the barriers to public interest research connect to bigger platform or to bigger questions about platform accountability. Um, so if you agree that this is an important issue, uh, I would like to invite you to contribute your stories um, to a campaign that we're going to be launching in a couple of days um, called Researchers Left on Red. Um, we're trying to collect stories uh, from researchers in addition to the ones that we've already collected and pass the message on to European policy men, uh, policymakers, both through the DSA consultation process, but also um, through some of our advocacy work. So um, here's my email. I'd be really happy if you um, got in touch or also happy to discuss um, during the Q&A. But um, I would like to now hand the mic over to Patty, who's going to talk about how exactly we can move beyond transparency seasoning. Um, and he's going to be presenting some of our uh, main findings from the joint report. So Patty, on to you. Okay, Mackenzie, thank you so much um, for, for kicking things off. I'm just going to go ahead and uh, share my screen here. Okay. There we go. Okay, so uh, I'm going to be telling you in a bit more detail what we found in our report. Um, and up front, I'll say uh, an important part of the report, the first chapter is, is kind of describing, uh, in I think more detail than we've seen in previous literature, the problems that uh, Kendi was talking about, about you know, um, the importance of data access for researchers, as well as the failures of self-regulation in its various forms of uh, delivering the goods. Uh, but what the real contribution, as I see it, of this report is, is that we um, try to look at other industries and see what kind of best practices we can take away from them. Um, and this has, to, uh, this has to do with basically our concern that we risk uh, reinventing the wheel here, wheel here um, in the sense that transparency in general and data access are not new issues and have been uh, addressed in the past. And we shouldn't necessarily see I think the discussions that are happening with platforms now is completely novel. Um, and so to that end, our first uh, challenge was to find appropriate case studies, because there are in fact many, many industries in which data access and uh, uh, transparency in general are regulated. Um, and we did that on the basis of, well, first of all, a broad inventorization, but then seeing what are really the problems we identify in the platform uh, data access context that we want to find solutions for. And the first of those is what we're now uh, basically calling the, the privacy problem, which is to say, on the one hand, there are strong arguments uh, made by platforms as well as third parties that, well, uh, transparency has its limits because the data involved tends to be personal data. And therefore, there are legal and ethical considerations which prevent us from uh, making it uh, available to researchers. And for that, for that problem, we decided, let's look at the medical context because this is an area in which uh, very sensitive personal data is central to all sorts of research, and nonetheless, research still gets done. Uh, and we found some very interesting frameworks there to draw on. The other uh, problem, broadly speaking, that we identify is what we're terming the incentive problem. And that is to say, even if uh, platforms uh, could find privacy compliant ways of sharing data, there are other uh, incentives, which are more reputational and commercial, which um, mean they don't actually want to in many cases. And we need to find ways for the law to uh, make transparent systems that have an actual direct interest in confidentiality. Uh, and there uh, we look at the, um, the, uh, the context of pollution and environmental regulation, uh, which is a similar context in which the uh, disclosing parties don't have a direct incentive in making uh, knowledge public about their activities. So let's get into more detail about what our findings have been here. Uh, so let's start with the, the medical context. What we looked at uh, in most detail was a framework from Finland, which is called FinData. It's a relatively new system, 
which uh, aims to make uh, data from all sorts of Finnish uh, health institutions, including government institutions, as well as private entities uh, available for researchers. And the way that works is that FinData is this uh, umbrella organization to which researchers can submit questions. And then once uh, FinData receives a legitimate research question, they will then search for uh, the data that's necessary. So that, that kind of process looks a bit like this. Uh, a researcher submits a, what they call a data utilization plan, which data they need, what reason they'll need it, and how they'll be using it. And then FinData will scrutinize that based on certain public interest standards, as well as data security standards, et cetera. And subsequently, they will gather the data and make it available to the researchers. So this is a system in which data is never sent directly from the source to the researcher. Uh, and this intermediary institution, FinData, performs a few crucial functions. Um, and those are not only, as I just said, evaluating the plans, making sure they comply with, with privacy standards, uh, but also uh, pseudonymizing the data in certain cases and making available the access infrastructure through which the data is ultimately made available. This is done through what they call secure operating environments, which are virtual machines that are hosted on uh, thin data servers, which is to say that um, it's not the case that the researcher uh, actually receives the data in most cases and can do whatever they want with it, you know, sell it to third parties, etc. Um, no, the data remains on the servers of, um, of thin data. The researchers can then remotely access that data to do their certain calculations or analysis, whatever they want to do. But that importantly restricts their ability to do things other than th those things that they um, agreed to do with the data and prevent abuse. So here are some of the key lessons we, we take away from, from the thin data study. And the first and the most important one, I think, is that this oversight body plays a, a, an essential role in the process, not only in enforcing relevant laws, but also in actually um, facilitating the access to data in terms of pre-processing the data, pseudonymizing it where necessary, aggregating it where necessary, but also providing the actual uh, infrastructures to which the data is accessed. Um, another very interesting aspect of this system is that uh, the, there are different access tiers. Um, so an important distinction is made between uh, data permits where researchers get this virtual access to the data I described, um, or there's a, a less, lesser tier of access called a data request in which effectively you ask a research question to FinData and they will answer the question for you. And, and there's a, a subsidiarity principle whereby uh, FinData tries to find the solution to the research question, which is the least privacy invasive. Um, it is also notably a, a, a flexible and what we call a request-based regime, which is to say that the government and the legislators who designed this have not tried to define in advance what the relevant types of data are that should be disclosed. Instead, um, researchers uh, make the demands and then FinData will um, try to determine ex post rather than ex ante whether that is a valid uh, research question. And this outsources this difficult question of what is public interest data uh, to the researchers who are going to use this data, rather than making that a very difficult question for the legislators to determine ex ante. And finally, uh, importantly, uh, GDPR compliance, it is possible. Um, FinData has done very extensive due diligence to make sure that their framework complies with uh, data protection laws. Um, and so uh, some of the, the features I um, just described uh, really help in, in terms of things like um, data protection by design, as well as data minimization. It's also interesting to note, for example, that individual data subject rights can still be exercised. FinData has created a dedicated portal through which uh, individuals can, for instance, exercise their rights to rectification or their right to removal from the data set. Um, so uh, the, that one of the most important lessons we see here is that if you make um, a serious effort out of it, it is possible to do uh, research access in a GDPR compliant way. So um, let me then turn to uh, the, the second case study we did, which is about environmental protection law. Here we looked at the uh, so-called European Pollutant Release and Transfer Regulation, uh, also known as the EPRTR, um, which is a, uh, a framework uh, devised about 15 years ago through which uh, industrial facilities who release uh, polluting uh, 
um, materials into the environment must disclose that to their national regulators. That information is then collected in a public database so that you can see how much is being um, emitted of which kinds of uh, pollutant throughout the European Union. And, and now it has over 30,000 uh, uh, industrial facilities um, part of this system. Um, and it's proven to be quite a valuable resource for, for journalists and for researchers, as well as for regulators uh, regarding um, uh, environmental debates. And uh, we, we think this is instructive because as you can imagine, uh, pollution data is not something that industrial facilities would necessarily want to uh, disclose in full. Indeed, they have incentives to, to minimize uh, or perhaps even to misreport uh, their degree of, of pollution. And there are several safeguards we can see in the system which help to push back against that. The first and the most obvious is, is that this is a binding system of mandatory rules, not a voluntary or opt-in system, uh, as well as that there is a, a advanced uh, system of oversight where the national uh, regulators are charged with verifying uh, the data provided by uh, the industrial facilities and enforcing imposing sanctions if it doesn't uh, comply. And the standard they apply here is whether the data is complete, consistent, and credible, which it might be an interesting kind of source of inspiration looking at regulation of platforms going forward. A, a crucial uh, part of this enforcement system is that there are standardized methods for data generation. So um, the ways in which pollution are measured are not left to, for, the plat for, sorry, for the facilities to decide, but are specified in the regulatory system which uh, makes sure that the data is indeed uh, you know, reliable and consistent and that there's less ability for the, for the industrial facilities to distort the picture in, in, in certain ways. Um, another interesting feature is that, there, yes, there are exceptions which uh, the facilities can uh, rely on if they don't want to uh, disclose all of their data, but the default setting is indeed transparency. In other words, the burden of proof is on the industrial facility to explain why a certain exception applies and they shouldn't disclose, rather than the burden of proof being on the regulator to show why the data needs to be disclosed in the first place. Uh, indeed, if a industrial facility wants to um, um, apply for one of these uh, exceptions, they still need to disclose the data in full to the regulator. Uh, it may not then become public, but the regulator can then still see all the data and determine whether the claim is being made legitimately. So this is another important safeguard to make sure that we're getting the right data from these companies. Uh, I, I also think there's some general or cross-cutting best practices we can see from these uh, different uh, initiatives. Uh, the first being simply that there's hard law, binding law, this is not self-regulation, uh, and there is this important role for in, independent bodies in, in both systems to facilitate both uh, legally and practically what's going on. Uh, another important point is proactive support for researchers. That is to say that uh, it's not just about making the data available, but also about uh, raising awareness amongst researchers that they know that this data is available and can be used, as well as assisting them if they have questions about the data and, and its origins, for example, uh, are in the most extreme cases, or I'd say most important as well, also uh, funding for relevant research activities. A final point is that these systems, neither FinData nor PRTR, uh, um, try to distinguish who becomes eligible. Uh, there is no privileged regime for certain research groups, certain media organizations, certain universities. Uh, anyone who wants to make use of this data can in theory do so. Uh, and I, I would say this is valuable not only for the uh, effectiveness and the impact of these systems, but also for their perceived legitimacy and independence. Uh, finally, I'm going to close with some, some open questions we still have, uh, some of the most important ones at least. The most crucial one, I would say, is that uh, this report and its case studies have still been agnostic to the precise scope of what this could look like when we talk about platforms. Um, are we talking only about social media, for example, or e-commerce as well? Um, so what kind of platforms are we talking about? What types of data, uh, in any general sense, uh, should be part of this regime, as well as who would be the appropriate oversight body in the platform context, are I think still very much open questions. Um, a kind of meta question which relates to that is, to which extent can we de delegate this kind of decision making to the oversight body? There are strong arguments to be made that we shouldn't be trying to have exhausted lists in, in legislation of what kind of data should be involved. 
and that it might be more flexible for to have the oversight body make those decisions. Nonetheless, there must be some kind of uh, general uh, demarcation of what data are involved, what the scope of the system is. So this is an important meta level question about the specificity of the governance regime. Uh, briefly, liability is an important question. Who is liable for errors in the data, leaks in the data? Uh, you want to get the right balance between encouraging platforms to disclose data uh, while also making sure that they're uh, doing that in a careful, privacy compliant uh, and uh, accurate way. Uh, and the last point I'll make is there between the two case studies I've described, we see a very important difference between, on the one hand, proactive systems of disclosure, such as the PRTR, in which it's creating public data sets, uh, uh, you know, with the, the regime basically defining in advance what is useful data versus a reactive system such as the thin data system in which uh, there is no uh, data sets being created ex ante, but you wait for researchers to come to you with research questions. It's, for example, also the distinction we see between um, open government data systems, which are proactive, and uh, Freedom of Information Act requests, which are reactive. Uh, they both have their merits. I don't have time to discuss it in detail now, but perhaps there is a balance we can find combining these different forms of disclosure and transparency regulation. So that is in a, in a very quick uh, nutshell uh, what we've tried to cover in the 100 pages of this report. Uh, I hope this was uh, clear and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Paddy. We do have one clarification question from okay. Maria um, regarding thin data. Is there a time frame for them within which they have to come back to the respondent? How long do they have to get back to whoever requested information? That's a very good question. Uh, I'll need to check that for you. I don't have that uh, right now, but uh, let, let me look that up for you. It's an important question. Thank you very much. Uh, and we have a final presentation from Julia who will uh, present uh, another way to look at the problem and uh, potentially a solution. Julia, you have the floor. Thanks. Thanks, Roxana. And thanks everyone for participating. I hope you can all hear me well. Otherwise, I will see some messages probably popping on the side. Um, I hope you won't mind. The topic of today's seminar is really broad and is really interesting for me and for the work I'm, I'm carrying out. So uh, in order to keep my speech in the, in the agreed uh, time frame and make sure that we'll have time for, for final discussion that I very much look forward to. I put down some notes, so I will uh, mostly be looking at that uh, without a, a PowerPoint presentation, so I hope you can all bear with me. To start with, I would say, well, the, the rise of online platforms, to, to take it from really from the broadest perspective possible, has touched upon several legal policy and institutional sectors. So in this sense, I'm really happy to participate to this talk today as I, I, I've always valued the effort of overcoming the limits of our own specific personal expertise and putting things in a broader perspective. So I think Mackenzie's and Paddy's contributions and interventions just gave me really insightful food for thoughts uh, regarding access to information, whatever this information is, and research practices and the related, uh, let's say, tensions that can emerge in the digital world, where basically data and information is pretty much everything. I mean, the whole jackpot. Um, in the next few minutes uh, that I have now at disposal, as Rosanna mentioned, I. I'd like to present actually a, another a complementary, in any case, a different point of view, uh, which is still highly relevant for what we may want to call for the purpose of today's talk, uh, the management of information online. And it has to do with copyright law and especially copyright law in Europe at EU level. And I think the title actually of the seminar today fits perfectly with, with the focus of, of my own work and, and the short presentation I'm giving is, I think copyright law is all about free versus protected information, uh, online or offline. 
It has been about free and versus protected information since its very beginning. So the very first copyright experiences in Europe, I don't want to make it too boring or long, but they took the shape of a privilege issues to author, uh, authors or publishers, um, by, usually by the king or a central power who could actually control which books uh, could be distributed across society and which weren't. And also modern copyright regula um, legislations ultimately are all about free versus protected information as they um, basically rule our access to certain online content, which may be restricted depending on the country we are, the status we hold, or the purpose of our use. So if copyright law is about free versus protected information, it is quite obvious that digital copyright law is about free versus protected information online. And I think here the discourse gets, if possible, even more interesting. If, if I have to put it in extremely simple terms, and here, obviously, I need to warn oversimplifications are never a good thing, so it's a very risky one. Uh, but if I have really to just display the main features that are relevant right now for, for this perspective of the internet, I would highlight the fact that we have cost of expressions, uh, meaning the time and resources I need to invest to create content and uh, uh, information rich content uh, that remain pretty much the same. So I, I need time, energies, resources offline as online to create something original. What goes dramatically down is actually the cost of reproduction. And online, these costs virtually appro approach the zero. So our click of copy and paste is literally a two seconds business. Also online, the demand for creative content becomes potentially global. So potentially much more lucrative. And that's another very important question, a uh, very important aspect to, to keep in mind. Now, all these circumstances make it quite easy for me at least to frame the story to you of online information and creativity along the perspective of its winners and its losers and i can anticipate to you without much suspense that we are unanimously and pretty much confidently all agreeing with the fact that authors and artists are the losers in, the, in this story and producers and intermediaries, the big protagonists of today's talk, are the big winners. So now what has copyright law uh, to do with all of this? I would like uh, you to think of copyright and that's a, an express invitation now, um, to think of copyright as a legal tool which has two faces. So one is the power of granting exclusive rights to authors, which can be of course alienated, transferred, contracted about, uh, bargained, but in any case, which allocates the power of authorized the use of some content in the hands of one or few individuals. Now, here there is an important caveat. Let's all remember, or for those of you who are familiar, this is obvi obviously something already well known, but let's remember copyright does not protect information or ideas per se. Um, it protects the expression. So the exclusive power to authorize the use of something, some content online, can be exercised, for example, over a song, over a book, a movie, a theater play, an article, a press article, but not on the facts and information embedded in it. So this is really a crucial uh, dichotomy, what we call in uh, copyright jargon, the idea, the expression dichotomy. But let's move to the second phase of copyright, which is the intrinsic limitation and exception and list of exceptions to this exclusivity, to this having the authorization, the right to authorize in the hands of few. And basically, this means the power of the law to lift the need of an authorization for an authorization and enable people we will see in a while what does it mean and who uh, who are people if everyone or not 
um, to enable people to simply use the content and be quite comfortable and quite confident that they are not violating any exclusive rights. Now, by presenting to you these two phases of, of copyright, my emphasis is actually on the potential of copyright law to protect and set free some creative content. So basically, if we focus on the title of today's seminar, the potential of copyright law is actually to remove the verses and replace it with a more reconciling, let's say politically correct and compromising end. That's the power that really copyright law has and, and carries with, uh, with its own norms. Of course, this would happen in an ideal dreamland, Walt Disney, Pixar world. The reality of copyright law, especially if we look at the European scenario right now, which is so dynamic and changing, is much more disillusioned, is facing huge challenges. And I think for today's uh, discussion, I would like to call your attention to two of the big challenges that we are um, we are discussing now for a couple of years and we've been thinking about in, in academia, but also the public debate has been so vibrant about um, uh, both of, of them. The first one is the fact that European copyright law is trying to enhance the protection of press articles. So we are talking now explicitly and, ex and specifically of press content, journalistic uh, articles, and whatever comes from the press industry. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the new directive, so let me just uh, mention there has been now a new directive adopted in 2019, which will be implemented in all member states uh, in the European Union by June uh, 2021. And Article 15 of this new directive um, obliges for-profit intermediaries, so we are talking about online intermediaries, which are mm, fundamentally commercial, like, for example, the big, the classic example is Google News, but any news aggregator and press review uh, website can, can fall into this category. Um, well, Article 15 obliges these actors to get a license for the use of press articles, parts of press articles, and even the famous snippets, the, the very short parts, uh, excerpts, from, from press contents, which makes actually the news aggregation something very handy and that is very comfortable for the, for the user, for the consumer. Now, uh, Google anticipated the national implementation of this uh, article, announcing just a few, a few days ago a licensing scheme for press publishers. Obviously, much has been said about and against this provision. I'm not going, I don't have the time to go into the detail. We may discuss it later on if there is any interest in this direction. I can tell you the, the, may, the most problematic and debated points are actually the fact that it's supposed to ultimately benefit reporters, but we are not really sure whether it will. Uh, negotiation power is a key problem. Not all publishers we know, not all press publishers, uh, have the capacity, the, the strength, the, the negotiation, uh, negotiation power to sit at the table with actors like Google or Facebook. The only point that I would like to add on this today, on this specific aspect, is the fact that Article 15 ultimately makes us understand even better that access to journalistic content is about visibility of that content online. So the fact that platforms are like Google, for example, are now framing um, their new mechanism of compliance with the new law, with the upcoming law um, at national level, is a new service they offer to press publishers, tells us actually a lot about the risk in terms of weaker media pluralism and consolidation of a so-called media oligarchy. Jumping to the second big challenge copyright is facing in Europe, I would call your attention to Article 17, which is again a very crucial pivotal part of the directive and deals with the protection of, con of original content in general, 
uh, when this content is used by an online platform, particular kind of uh, online platform. So we are talking here of online content sharing platforms in social media. This provision reforms in a nutshell, in a very, very brief explanation, which is something almost impossible to do, uh, reforms the liability regime of online content sharing platforms with the aim to minimize the violation of copyright of protected works when users are uploading material sharing content publicly engaging as we all do with platforms like uh, youtube and facebook the big question here is whether this will actually lead to the yes two minutes to the pro i'm almost done to the proliferation of so-called uh, upload filters something which is not only undesirable from the perspective of internet as a digital space where we all communicate and express ourselves, but also something which is putting a scar on the face that I, that on, the, on the face of copyright, as I call it before, which aims to set certain uses, works or individual free from the need of an authorization. So my takeaways, that I suggest, the takeaways that I suggest for today's discussion are actually the following. First of all, we all know copyright is more protecting than setting content free. And even if we agree and embrace its justification, we should never underestimate its impact on the media environment we want to build or we wish for, for ourselves and our society. At the same time, we shouldn't uh, forget the potential of copyright in actually doing also this, um, this reverse uh, mechanism or operation of setting some contents and uses or setting some individuals in society, some groups of individuals in society free from the need for an authorization. And in this way, I think identifying around us, but also ahead of us, which uses of material or which material online is crucial for us, for our democratic social life to have free from this need of authorization is absolutely the most uh, sustainable and maybe one of the few ways that we can really, um, we can really go for to balance the need to remunerate creators and also have a prosperous cultural environment. Um, obviously, I would, I would have tons of points to add in relations also to the previous presentation, but I leave it to the discussion. I very much look forward to that. And I invite you, whoever of you is uh, interested more specifically on developments of copyright law in Europe, among the many sources uh, that are available online, there is also the website of the project I'm um, primarily working with, which is called the Recreating Europe. Maybe I will just link the, the website on the on the chat. Thank you very much for the for the attention.